So uh, our first session is on, is on sensing and mechatronics. And so I'd like to involve, uh, invite uh, the moderator, Paul Stent here, to come up to the podium. Paul is uh, formerly the head of uh, biomedical engineering at the University of Toronto and is a, a serial entrepreneur and a, an insightful uh, participant uh, in the techno organization. So Paul, I, I give the podium to you. Uh, let's get going. Thank you very much, David. Uh, just a few brief comments before I invite um, our, all of our three speakers up here uh, who are going to be participating in this session. Sensor technology, the ener energy systems that drive them, the diagnostic information uh, that they transport and the therapies that they guide and in many cases deliver are now being integrated into systems and concepts today that are beyond what our imagination was for them. Uh, just 10 years ago. The inaugural three speakers of this year's uh, Techno Symposium, I think, are sure to impress you this morning with uh, and, and, and test your imagination, maybe even taunting um, it, maybe even taunting your emotions with what you will see them describe here uh, today and what is in the potential of these technologies. Um, and where they will take us. So without further ado, I'd like to invite um, Dr. Popovich and Dr. Manget and uh, Dr. Uh, Gernot uh, Gondriff to come and join me up on the stage. Um, I don't think there's any particular seat that um, is assigned to you, except for the first one, Milos. As, as moderator, I'll take that one. <laughs> Our first speaker uh, this morning professor is, uh, is Professor Popovich. Um, he arrived at the University of Toronto in the early 2000s, and since his arrival, he's really been shaking our heads uh, here with um, his work in brain-machine interfaces that has been dissected into new therapies for neural rehabilitation, all the way from with technologies and innovation that span uh, the interaction of these materials from the molecular and cellular level with stem cells all the way up to the gross motor skills of robotics and sensor systems. Dr. Popovich is recipient of many um, innovations awards. He's a recognized Canada research chair and is co-founder of a very successful young startup and perhaps um, most impressive to me and I, and I hope he keeps his passion towards this. He is leading a charge uh, for the development of, the, of a center uh, called the Research and Advanced Neural Implant Applications, which has um, all the imagination uh, that uh, this individual uh, has uh, displayed to us over the past decade and, and will continue over much time. Milos, the floor is yours. Thank you, Paul, for this very kind introduction. So, um, as you already know, I come from the of Biometrics and Biomedical Engineering, but I'm also employed at a Toronto Rehab, at, uh, and I work at the Linker Center, which is a spinal cord injury uh, unit. So I'll talk about brain-machine interfaces, because David wanted me to talk about sensing, which may be pertinent to robotics. So first, a little disclaimer. I, as Paul said, I, I'm a shareholder in the company MindTech, but this presentation has no conflicts with respect to that. So. Do we really need this type of technology and why would we need that? So here are some of the justifications for this. So we're really working very hard on creating very sophisticated prosthetic systems which are essentially robots. And this is about 22 or 24 degrees of freedom device which has been funded by DARPA and successfully developed. The challenge with this device is not only to build it, which is a challenge on its own, but how do you control this, right? So it has multiple degrees of freedom and as we all are controlling our hands, you want to control each and every degree of freedom independently, and yet you should be able to command uh, coordinated movements with that as well. So when you try to put this on a patient, this is not a trivial matter. And right now, the way how we try to handle this problem is essentially we have 60 EMG sensors which are placed right on the pectoral muscle of the patient and the nerve which was before, or, or nerves which before used to innervate the arm are now connected to the pectoral muscle and you try to record from that. This is lovely to write the journal papers, right, and, and get in nature, 
But if you want to build a product, this is very difficult to actually use in everyday life. And any of you who has tried to use Siri and has a lovely accent as I do, knows that this technology doesn't work either, right? Because when I try to get my name from Siri, it starts telling me that I'm using profound words and tells me that Papa bitch is not acceptable. <laughs> so another one is eye tracking, and eye tracking is also a problem because it's a two degrees of freedom system. Uh, very fast, very elegant, but uh, you, you usually use your eyes for other things as well, right? So not only for control. So one of the potential solutions, and this is one of the patients who has been implanted with a uh, neuro implant for brain machine interface is this. This is just beginning of the story and we are not yet there and I'll tell you why in a few minutes, but this is an emerging technology that you should be uh, aware of. Another problem statement is not a conservative member of the parliament, uh, Stephen Fletcher, but it's actually individual who has to, who is very public individual and he has to do a lot of paperwork and a lot of things that uh, in daily life. And usually this is right now with individuals who have high level spinal cord injury like uh, Mr. Fletcher, essentially they need an attendant all the time. So managing your workload during the day requires some new ways of going about it. And so of course brain machine interface has been considered as a solution to interface with a computer to help communicate and also to navigate the wheelchairs uh, in the everyday environment. All these technologies are just emerging. This is not something you can go to the uh, eBay and order. So, uh, but it's coming very fast and furious towards us. So the, the last one which I want to show you is, and I have participated in this development, is developing a therapy which helps severely paralyzed spinal cord injury patients and stroke patients recover the voluntary function. The way the therapy works is essentially you are asking the patient to perform different reaching and grasping tasks and those tasks that patient is not able to do, you assist with electrical stimulation. As you do it repetitively, you get this brain retrain to be able to do this on his or her own. And it's very exciting, and you can go to our webpage to see some videos about it. But the challenge with this is right now, everything is done by the therapist. Therapist tells you which type of movement you should perform and in which sequence and how. So this is easy when you have one type of movement, but I have various different grasping styles becomes very challenging to do that. So, and of course, if you use both hands, that becomes even more challenging. Right? How do you manage the conflict of the two arms? So one of the things that we are working towards is try to come up with a brain machine interface, which uses a minimum number of electrodes placed on the, on the head of the subject. So the subject can actually control the therapy and we can remove the pressing of the push button by the therapist. And not only that, but also the timing when you imagine the movement and then you want to perform it has to be synchronized for this brain plasticity to work in a, in a right fashion. And I'll show you some logic behind that. So this all looks very nice and, and, and we are, there's a lot of people working in this field and since uh, I think 2000 we had only one person, one, two, three papers on brain machine interfaces and now we have hundreds of them almost per month. But the problem in the field, there are multiple problems in the field. So one of the problems is how do you get the st stable and robust recordings from the brain? Those things that you've seen in the, in the news and, and, and on 16 minutes from, um, I think it was from Pittsburgh, essentially use this type of electrode, which is an implanted electrode which goes directly into the motor cortex. Works very well, you can get very nice recordings. The problem is the electrode starts dying off at six months and by two years, in best case scenario, you cannot record anything from it. So having something implanted in a patient that lifespan is only two years is not very exciting for patients. Also, if you use a surface recording system, this is unattainable. Going around with a swimming cap with tons of cables is not exciting at all. So we want to have a minimum number of recording electrodes. And the other thing which we also want to have is a synchronous brain machine interface. Most of these interfaces essentially says, okay, Milos, now think about what you want to do. You think what you want to do and he commands that thing. But in reality, in daily life, you want to do other things. You want to think about your you know, hamster, if you have hamster at home and you want to think about your lunch. And then when you think about the movement of the hand, you want that, at that point in time, the hand to move, but not when you're thinking about hamster. So being able to have a continuous recording of your system and being able to distinguish when you're thinking about hamster or chicken wings and hand movement, and to be able to distinguish them is very important, right? Second thing is robust detection. 
We in our field are very pleased to tell you, oh, we have 75% accuracy of the system. This means, in engineering terms, I failed 25 times out of 100. Imagine that hand hits you 25 times out of 100 robotic arm. That's not very appealing. Reliability has to be 99.9% .9 or something or even more for this to be a meaningful technology. So uh, I'm sorry to tell you, but I'm not doing better than that. So we're, that's what I'm telling you. We're not really closer to uh, a commercial device yet. And the final thing, which is very important, is a hidden message, right? Nobody talks about it, but there's a big elephant or a couple of elephants sitting in the room, is that when we build these robotic systems that we control with brain machine interface, a lot of the dynamics and kinematics of that system we control and constrain. So whatever we do with the brain machine interface actually triggers the system and tells roughly where it should go and it should do. But robot always goes back to the same initial position, starts from the same initial position. We don't do that. When I take my toothbrush, I bring it here, then I go and put this. I don't always go to initial position <laughs> and go, because you don't, I don't reset the system every time I want to brush my toothbrush or my, my teeth. So that's a very important thing, and it's hidden. Nobody talks about it, but it's huge, right? So we wanted to tackle this problem, and we want to uh, actually do something which is a little bit unique. We wanted to figure out different hand functions or hand postures, can we detect them and can we detect them reliably using actually surface uh, recording system. So right now, as I told you, what we're able to do is we can tell you kinematically where the arm is in space at any given time with some degree of accuracy. But if you want to figure out which type of grasp I'm performing, that's very difficult to do. So what my colleagues and the rest of the universe does, essentially does the following thing. If you want to open a hand, imagine your mother-in-law. And if you want to close your hand, imagine your foot. So neither of them are related to hand opening, hand closing. So there's a conflict in, in the brain, what you're trying to do and try to relate. And then eventually, that, that's how the system works. So it's very slow. And because it's very slow, and it doesn't trigger it exactly at the moment you want hand to open and close, you have a time delay. So as you're imagining the thing that you want to perform, there's a lot of time before the thing starts happening. What you would really like to do is, as you're imagining movement or task that you want to perform, that task starts kicking in. So you have to, dis you have to be able to detect the movement before actually the human will start performing it. So that's a tricky business. So in what I'm going to show you today, we actually address both issues. So first of all, this is what we have done. We tried to get a system that will be able to figure out which grasp of men you're able to do. And not only that, it's going to be able to determine it before you actually start moving your hand, which is called premotor uh, activity of the brain. This is the placement of the electrodes. I won't go into technical details, but what's important, you can record it from this side of the brain or that side of the brain. Why is that important? Because if I build a robotic system or electrical stimulation system for patient and patient had a stroke, that part of the brain, which is controlling right hand, is gone. So I need to be able to control it from the ipsilateral side of the head. Okay, so these are different grasping styles we use. These four which are in red are typical grasping styles that you use for 70% of your tasks and activities of daily living. And the other two are just funky grasps to confuse the system. So here's the patient. You would go and ask, actually it's able-bodied subject. You ask the subject to uh, be prepared. You will select a particular grasp, present it to the patient, and on a sign, you'll ask him to perform the task. That's how we collected tons of data on many individuals, I think about 15 or something. And what is important here is this element, which is called ERD. Whenever you try to perform a particular task, certain group of frequencies in your EEG gets suppressed, right? That's because this, that's because this, this discovered by uh, uh, Fulcher, uh, oh my God. In, in, in 90s, and actually we have exactly the same thing when we do the recordings with our hand functions. So what uh, uh, our junior scientist, Cesar Marquez, came up with an idea, which is a very elegant idea. He says, in all these frequencies, what you have is this event-related desynchronization, which means frequency fires at a certain rate, and all of a sudden it dips down, sits slow, and comes back. So he created artificial uh, event related to synchronization, and he's constantly watching signals at different frequencies and waits when they start dipping down. And he's looking at the cross correlations. So what he essentially does is he takes the signal from the brain, spreads it into 15 different frequencies, and watches each of these frequencies how they 
correlate to this, uh, uh, what you might call a synthetic desynchronization event. And then he will get all these little white dots that you see, tells you exactly when these levels of cross correlation are very high. What this is interesting here is these are the frequencies from zero to 50 hertz, which we normally record in our EEG labs. And we record it from minus two seconds to zero seconds from the moment the hand starts moving. So you can see almost a second before you can figure out what's going on. These are different trials, and this is how they look like. It's about 10 to 20 hertz. And then when you sum them together, what you get is you get this kind of a mask, telling you that if at about 0.5 seconds, 1.5 seconds, you start having this activity, you're probably having a pinch grasp. So we do the same thing for different grasping styles, and you get these different mats, or uh, what you call it, masks. So as you're performing a grasp, you're ticking what type of cross correlations you're getting, and somewhere here, you already are able to figure out that none of these is the one that you're looking at, but it's this particular one. And that way, you can determine what grasping style the patient is performing. So here are the results. Uh, this is what you get with all the electrodes. This is when you go with the contralateral electrodes, ipsilateral electrodes, and electrodes placed in the middle. These are different grasping styles, and as you can see, the numbers are about 75%, as I've shown you, and this is considered really good in the field. And this is the chance level. As you can see, we can determine all relevant grasping styles except for hand opening. Why can't we determine the hand opening? I don't know. And don't ask me that question. That would be inappropriate. So, <clears throat> but we're trying to figure that out, and there are other tricks we can use to deal with that. So you can see if I do it non-dominant hand, I get the same results, and essentially, I have very reliable uh, detection method using surface stimulation, a surface recording technology, and I can do it ahead of time before the patient actually starts moving the hand, which is very exciting, and we are, I think, first people to do that. So what do we have? We have a system that can determine five out of six different grasping styles. We can determine all of those styles that are really relevant for training and for performing reaching and grasping, actually different grasping styles and activities of daily living. Uh, we are not able to detect hand opening, as I showed you, uh, and we will have to figure out why. But what we can do is we can do it in using both contralateral and ipsilateral recordings from the brain, from both sides of the brain. And what we can do is we can do it for dominant and non-dominant hand equally accurate. And this is online method, so you can implement it in any PC that you have. And I can determine which grasp posture you're trying to perform in a worst case scenario, 300 microseconds, milliseconds before the hand starts moving. And this is, of course, each subject has its own different matrices or different masks. And we believe that when you put it in a closed loop system, you should be able to improve this reliability. And if these are the people who have done all the work, I'm just talking. So this is Cesar Marquez, uh, Omid, and Katrin Atwell. And if you want to find what else we do, this is our webpage. Thank you.